Good morning. morning. It is so good. (laughs) Guten Tag, yes. Oh, man. We're heading for Germany. We're going to pray about that here in a little bit. We're heading for Germany this afternoon, so you can be praying for us. Uh, But I will tell you, my mind has been in a thousand different places. But God's at work, isn't he? God's working in our hearts and minds. Let me remind you, as I said two months or two months, two weeks ago, God loves you. God loves you. He cares for you. He cares about what's going on in your life, regardless of what those circumstances are. And because of that, we've been challenged. Last week, particularly, we talked about how we're supposed to think about the people in our lives, particularly the challenging people in our lives, a little bit differently, which brings us to this, right? Suzanne and Chris, would you give me a hand collecting some of these? Um, That way... I don't talk and have my backside to everyone at the same time. God's been moving. God's been challenging us as a church body. And I'm watching all these conversations that we're having come together. Now, I will tell you that today's conversation is is tougher. They get tougher as we go along. Aren't you excited about that? I'm sure you are. So let's see how God's been working with you. Thank you, guys. And gal, sorry. All right, now here's the real challenge, right? Is as I share these, this is part of our conversation. I got to make sure none of them are talking about how I dress or anything like that. <laughs> God is trying to teach me patience, which with patience, I will be more accepting and kind. I have no idea who that is, but let's all pray for them to have more patience. No, let's not do that. You know what happens when you ask God for patience, right? Yeah, he gives you opportunities for learning that. Um, let's see. You all think I'm skipping past yours, right? God, let me realize how lucky I am with health, family. Uh, I need to, to fellowship with others more and give more to help others. Good. God knew that I needed to change, so he made changes in me that I needed. Even that wasn't easy for me. Amen. I, I've been working, God's been working on creating a new steadfast heart in me, and I won't go into a whole lot of what that means. But again, when God starts working in an area, he gives you all kinds of opportunities for it. With all that's happening in our world, I found myself almost hating groups of people instead of feeling love for them. I need to love them like God loves them. Man, that is true today, isn't it? I mean, that's, that strikes to the core of what's going on in the world. I mean, everything that's going on. This past week with the stuff going on in France, you know, another terrorist attack. What do we do with that? How do we, we're conflicted, aren't we? We're conflicted with, I'm supposed to feel love but man, there's so much hate and there's so much anger. What do, what do I do with that? That's, that's a good one. Every day at devotion time, God speaks directly to me with his love and his guidance. It helps me see others as he sees them. It's still a lot of work, but he's with me. Start your day out that way. That's good. God is helping me see the good in people rather than the bad. Some of these I'm skipping because your handwriting is almost like mine. God has been throwing so many different obstacles in front of me with my relationships, and I came to finally realize that I have to stop judging people and start praying for them instead. That's a good one. That's how you really get over this challenge. I mean, Jesus said, pray for your enemies. Sometimes I wish he hadn't said that. God opened my eyes and heart to mend an old, broken relationship. Forgiveness with a heart. That's good. Here's the one I laid down. It's empty. I was concerned for a friend who was having a hard time getting off the dime, so God showed me uh, how it felt and caused me to see. Good. A couple others. Uh-oh. My kids. He offers more grace and mercy than, ever, than I ever could, and he freely gives it to me. I need to and should show that kind of love to my kids and my family, which we talked a little bit about last week, didn't we? Sometimes it's the people close to us who we're challenged with the most. So as we read, and I, we could read all these, and what we are going to do is we're going to, these are all anonymous, and if they're not, we'll read through each and every one of them. We'll be praying over them, and we're going to start some walls on each side as we continue to share these conversations, and we're going to put these up on the walls so that we can be praying for them and, and continue to share with one another. Here's the question for this week and that I've been challenged with. So we've talked about how much God loves us, and we, we understand that God loves us. Yes? 
And we understand that because he loves us, not just me, but he loves all of us, we need to see people differently. We need to see them through his eyes, love people and care for them in a way that we might not have been, well, it's challenging, like we just, we just read. It's challenging sometimes with our kids, our spouse, the people we work with, the people we're closest with. It's a challenge in the world. We've got to change our heart and our mind and our eyes. But what challenged me this week is, is that the end of it? Once our heart is changed, our, is the work done? Is that the end of what we're supposed to do? Now, I mean, God sees us kind of how we are, and he sees us with love and care. Is that all? Does God just see us and say, I love you? What, what came next? Did he just say, I love you? Yeah, he showed it. He demonstrated it. He put action to, in fact, the word agape, and I've said, that we've talked about this more than once. The word agape love means unconditional love, but it's unconditional love as an action. It's a verb. God agape us. He put that love into action, and he wants us to love others the same way, which means not only do we need to change our heart, we need to change our actions, our behavior. We need to change the things that we do. Now, the reason we didn't start with changing our actions is because we need to change, deal with our heart condition sometimes before we deal with the action. Now, we had a conversation this week. Sometimes you do the action and the heart follows, doesn't it? Sometimes you have the heart and then out of that comes the action. Well, the way we're talking through this is we, we've seen and we're challenged to see people differently, and some of you are getting really uncomfortable because next we're going to talk about how do you treat people differently, not just view them differently. How do you act differently towards the people that God loves? Which means we're going to talk about a term that makes some of us uncomfortable. So now that I've told you that, I'm not going to tell you what it is for a second, all right? I want to lead into it. How many of you know what this logo is? About half in the room I'm expecting will know what this logo is. You know, I, heard, I think I heard it. Say it loud. Yelp. It's Yelp. Now, the, you know what the logo is. Uh, go ahead and put the next, yeah. Yelp. What is Yelp? How many of you have no idea what Yelp is? Okay, good. I'm looking at the age ranges. <laughs> Someone tell me what Yelp is. It's a what? It's a review site. If you want to go to a restaurant or something, you get on Yelp and you, you look at other people's reviews. So they go, as they go to a restaurant, they go and they Yelp about that restaurant. They tell you, they give it stars and they tell you how the service was. In fact, a bad Yelp review or consistent bad Yelp reviews can sink an entire restaurant. Now it's geared towards restaurant kind of things. It's geared towards people who go, they sit down. Now we actually use this this week. I gave my kids a challenge last weekend. I said, we're going to go do something fun. We're going to go to an ice cream shop. But here's the deal. I told my kids, I want you to go find an ice cream shop that we've never been to and is not in Parker that we can drive to in a reasonable amount of time. Now, I had to shorten that down because apparently one of my children thought four hours was a reasonable <laughs> amount of time. No, we are not driving to Missouri to get ice cream, all right? That's, that's not going to happen. I said, so, you know, within 30, 40 minutes Go find an ice cream shop. Guess where they all went to find an ice cream shop? They went to Yelp. Because I told them, it's got to be a good one. It's got to be a good ice cream shop. And wherever you go, uh, we, now they found them. And they found three really, in fact, it was so hard, we had to vote. So here, here we kind of got all five of us in, in the room. And we said, told each one of them, pitch your ice cream shop. Convince us that we need to go to your ice cream shop. And so they're all on their phones. Well, it's got this and it's got this. And, and here's what, what the deciding factor was. Well, mine has 4.5 out of 5 Yelp stars. Ooh. But that beat the, that we, that's the one we went to. And I'm trying to remember which one I went to. You're going to want to know, aren't you? Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. It'll come to me. Yeah, I will ask Logan. He'll know. It'll come to me here in a second. So we went, but we went to the ice cream shop and it was, you know, it's a good one when you drive up. It was a big, some of you may know it. It's a big milk jug. Yeah. And yeah, like downtown Denver, well, kind of downtown Denver. Do you know what it's called? 
What's that? You said it. Little man. That's it. That's what it is. Little man ice cream. It's got this big milk jug. It's all outdoors. So you walk up to the milk jug, order your ice cream, and you sit outside. It it was fun. Here's when you know it's good. We drove up at probably three o'clock in the afternoon, three or four o'clock in the afternoon, and there was a line down the street, which I hate lines, but I committed. We're going to this ice cream shop, and it was good. Now, let me tell you, why is Yelp, let me ask you this, why is Yelp so popular? Why, Why is it even a thing? Right? It's your peers, right? So you're not just trusting the restaurants to tell you how good they are, right? Why do we care? Why do we want to know? Saves time doing what? Oh, going to all and finding out which ones are good, which ones are bad? Save money? What is it we want to know? If it's worth it. If it's worth it. So there's really a couple things we want to know if it's worth it. Tell me, what are the two things? When you go, you imagine, for those of you who haven't gone to Yelp, what is it you want to know about a restaurant? Is it good food? Is it good food and is it good? Yeah. Service. Yeah. Is it value? Is it clean? Right. We want to know, if I'm going to this place and I'm going to give my money to them, am I going to get something good back in return? And when you read Yelp reviews, you will find out. You'll find out whether the service was good. Now, again, I think those two things sink a restaurant quicker than anything. It, it, and the, the, tri, the, the real key for a restaurant is that the food is good and the service is good. If either one of those is bad, what do you start thinking in your head? I mean, if you read a review and they said that the food was good, but the service, bleh, what are you thinking? Yeah, I'll find somewhere else. Or, all right, the service was really great, the food not so much. Really the same thing, right? How many of you ever been to a restaurant and had really bad service? I mean, like, epically bad service. And they're like, can, can you give me a tip? And the tip is, yes, find a new line of work. Yeah. One of those. We love to be served, don't we? How many of you like going out to eat? One of my favorite places in the whole world we went to last night. Can't go on Sunday. Any guesses? Chick-fil-A. Oh, I love Chick-fil-A. Because Chick-fil-A has great service. But you know, if you say thank you, what do they say? My pleasure. You know it's coming. In fact, I say thank you all the time just to hear it over and over and over again. You know when I, I know when I go there, I'm going to get good food. I swear they put drugs in the chicken. It is so good and it just draws you back to it. They don't. I, it was a joke as far as I know. (laughs) It's good food and it's great service. I love going to Chick-fil-A. In fact, last night, this is just a quick side note. This is free. It doesn't cost you anything. My daughter was lamenting that she wasn't a child because when you get the kid's menu, the kid's meal, you either get a prize or you can take that prize and take it back and get ice cream. And she wanted ice cream. And she said, I wish I was a kid, and I could get, but I want more food than is in the kid thing. Well, as we're walking out, Chick-fil-A is now doing this thing. It's called, I think they call it Family Electronic Free Night or something like that. And if your family goes and they put their phones down and they have conversations with one another, and you tell the manager that at the end of your meal, they'll give you ice cream. But my daughter didn't know that until we were out in the parking lot, and she was not happy with me. I didn't know it until the end either. We love to be served. How many of you have ever gone to a high-class restaurant where they really served you well? Man, you pay for it, don't you? I went to a place called True when I was in corporate world. True in Chicago. You, you, anyone know of True? Yeah, one person, and that's because um, none of us can afford it. I was, going, I was with a salesperson who had a, a corporate card that had a higher limit than mine. And we went to this place. It is a, a place we, we were trying to sell to. And it was a place you come in. And I've never been to a place like this before or since. There were two sides to the menu. You picked side A or side B. And there was a seven-course meal. And they brought you these seven courses. There was caviar on this staircase with mother of pearl spoons. And I didn't know what to do. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> they were ready to kick me out. Here was the kind of service we had. I was sitting, I was sitting at the table. How's it going, man? Good to see you. I was sitting at the table. I had a napkin on my lap, and, and I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. I dropped my napkin down 
on this side of the floor. Anyone ever dropped your napkin at a restaurant? Yeah, what do you normally do? You pick it up. I leaned down to pick up the napkin. Someone had already come and picked up the napkin, and before I sat back up, someone on this side put a new one in my lap. I wanted to do it from that moment on just to see how long they would do it. You know what I'm talking about? Drop a fork. Uh, hey, see how quick they can switch these things out. They brought, everything came to the table all at once. It was great service. We love to be served, don't we? I mean, how many of you love breakfast in bed? Given by your children? Not so much. Moms, on Mother's Day, you get children in bed, you get food in, or breakfast in bed from your children. What are you first thinking about? What does the kitchen look like? And the second thing is, is it edible? And, I tell you, and I've had these moments. It doesn't matter if it's edible. You eat it. You put it down. We love to be served. Ladies, how many of you like to go to the spa? Men, how many of you like? I shouldn't be sexist like that. But you're not going to admit it, are you? We like to be pampered. We like to be served. We like to be taken care of. It's part of our culture, isn't it? We love it. We love to be, we are a consumer culture. In fact, if there's a business that does not meet our needs, does not serve us well, we yelp about it. No, you may not be going on yelp, but if you get bad service, what do you tell them? I'm going to tell everybody. And I got to tell you how often I've had to like check myself. I'm like, I'm a pastor. I will tell, when I say I'll tell everybody, I mean, I will tell everybody. I, I don't pull that card, but boy, I want to sometimes because we want to be served. It's built into our entire culture, our entire society. Now, I know some of you know where I'm going with this, don't you? What are we talking about today? We're talking about serving. But we're not going to talk about serving the normal way because I know as soon as I say serving, some of you are like, he's going to ask me to be on the coffee team. I just know it. <laughs> He's going to ask me to serve in an area that I do not want to serve. He's going to ask me to do something. Now, if you were here for a service last week, you know we could use some extra help in the coffee department. Was the coffee warm today? Yes. yes. You know why? Because I didn't make it. Deb made the coffee. Thank you, Deb. We used the microwave last week. We got by, didn't we? We have this serving mindset in churches too, don't we? Well, if the church does, oh, we shouldn't talk about this, should we? Well, am I going to get in trouble? How many letters am I going to get this week? Is the music loud enough? Is the music too loud? We don't do enough. We don't do this. We don't, how come the pastor didn't look at me this? Actually, what I normally get is, how come the pastor keeps looking at me? <laughs> I swear I'm not. I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to look around, see everybody, Right? Why, why does it, we get this serving mentality that we need to be served, but that is not God's way. And we think, well, we're, now pastors are going to talk about all the dirty little chores that need to be done around the church. We got to start serving the church. I'm going to tell you, this is not that sermon. This is connected to everything we've talked about the past couple of weeks. God loves you. He loves everybody in your life. He wants us to think about ourselves and think about people differently. Give them a break. See that people are broken people who need the love of Jesus Christ, and God wants us to serve those people. What God wants is people who serve. Now, over and over again through the New Testament, and we're gonna I'm going to share you some of these, Jesus confronts the fact that we want to be served, but we don't want to serve. Can we just at least be honest? I'm going to start and be honest and say, I'd rather be served than serve. If given the choice of going into a restaurant, of serving the people in the restaurant or being served, guess which one I'm going to pick? I'm going to be served. If I have my choice, that's what I prefer. But is that what God wants from us? Now, so I was reading this week, and, and so I, I've got a computer program that helps me find, and, and I'm sorry about this because it, it helps me find every passage on any topic. I put in serving and just a whole list of, of verses come out. I don't even have to hunt through. Now, I go back and make sure they connect with what we're talking about. Here is a short list that I'm going to read to you this week of some of these topics. But one that came up was an interesting passage that came up. 
I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey that God took me through. Because as I started this preparing for this week, I was going down the usual path about, and, and I can tell you that this path, serving makes us more like Jesus. In fact, how many of you would like to be Christ-like? You, some of you think it's a trick question. I'm not raising my hand. If you want to be like Jesus, do you know what Jesus says you have to do? You have to serve. Period. You have to serve. Jesus saying, I'm going to read this. Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve. And that we need to be like him. So I was going down that whole path. When I saw this verse, and God drew me to this verse, and it's Luke chapter 4, verse 8. Now, in this Luke chapter 4 is when Jesus is being tempted by Satan. And I believe this is the third temptation that Satan brings to Jesus. And he's telling him, he takes him to the top of this mountain, and he says, look, I will give you this entire kingdom if you will just bow down and worship me. Imagine that scene. Satan is telling Jesus, I'll give you everything you see here. I'll give you this entire kingdom. If you will very simply bow down and worship me. Now, was there any way, any chance that that was going to happen? No. But it's what Jesus replies to him that caught my attention. Luke chapter 4, verse 8. Jesus replied, the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Must do what? Serve. Yeah. See, that's the one I went to, but that's not the whole thing. What came before that? You must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. By the way, that is a, a, a reading of Deuteronomy 6.13 that says, You must fear the Lord your God and serve him. When you take an oath, you must use only his name. Jesus says, You must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. We are a worshiping people. What did we just do this morning? We worshiped. Now, again, we get in our mindset that worship is law. Singing, is that what worship is? Partly. I mean, singing is worship as long as you're worshiping God. Now, singing a Taylor Swift song, not so much. But singing to God and about God and connecting with God, whether that's in your shower or in your car or on Sunday morning, that is worship. But according to Jesus in Luke 4, 8, what else is worship? Serving. There's a connection between us serving and us worshiping God. Now, we, I talked about this a little bit last week. The great commandment says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and body, and love other people. And Jesus connects us loving God by loving other people. He says, the way you love God is by loving people. You demonstrate how much you love God by demonstrating how much you love people. How does that happen? What's the word we use? It's the one we're talking about today. Serving. I, I'm sorry. I went on a tangent and I didn't bring you with me. Serving is how we love others. It is not about just doing the do, dirty work, the duty that needs to be done in the church. We need to think differently about people. We need to think differently about serving too. We're going to think differently about what serving means. It is not a chore. Are there chores that need to be done? Yes. There are things that need to happen. There's all kinds of things around the church in this family that need to happen. The point is not what needs to happen. The point is how and why we're doing the things that we do. And serving doesn't just happen in the church. How long are we here on a Sunday morning? Some of you say an hour. Some of you say all day, Pastor. I'm here all day long. I feel that way sometimes too. Serving is not just what we do. It's how we're doing it. And the New Testament, again, is full of passages. I'm not going to put them on the screen, but I'm going to say them slow enough. I want you to listen. I'm going to read one, two, three, four, five, six, seven passages that talk about serving. And see if you can catch the common themes here. Matthew 20, 24 through 28. Now, this is when James and John sent mommy to ask Jesus if they could be the highest in the kingdom. 
When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. But Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Do you see what Jesus is saying? Look, guys, I get that in culture, in society, people want power, they want influence, they want to be served. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Did you hear the key words there? I mean, Jesus uses one we don't like to use. Slave. He says, if you want to really serve, what does that mean? You're going to be a slave to other people. We don't like that, do we? Matthew 23, 11, just three chapters later, Jesus says, the greatest among you must be a servant. Luke 22, 25 through 27, Jesus told them, in this world, the kings and great men lord it over their people, yet they are called friends of the people, but among you it will be different. He's saying it the same thing in different circumstances. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank and the leader should be a servant. Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? What's the answer to that? No. Who's more important, the one who's sitting at the table or the one who serves? It's not the one who serves. It's the one who sits at the table. In fact, that's what Jesus, the one who sits at the table, of course, and he's saying in the world, that's the case. When the person is sitting at the table, they're the one in charge. But he says, not here among you, for I am among you as one who serves. Jesus is saying, I'm taking everything in culture and I'm turning it upside down. If you want to be important, you need to serve. In John 13, 1 through 7, I'm going to tell you this whole story. This is Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Have many of you ever been a part of a foot washing? Absolutely disgusting, isn't it? It's not supposed to be. I tell you what, yesterday I did a muck run. Rob and I did a run through the mud. Boy, you wouldn't want to wash my feet yesterday. What is it about a foot washing? It makes us uncomfortable. In fact, when Jesus started to wash his disciples' feet, what did the feet, their feet, what did, what did they say? What did Peter say? He said, you're not doing that. Absolutely not. And I can tell you, I've been in a foot washing ceremony and it made me uncomfortable. I didn't want to do it. I didn't mind washing someone else's feet. It was having someone wash my feet. It's a very intimate thing, this whole serving thing. We're going to come back to that. 1 John 2, 6. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. How should we live? As Jesus did. What did Jesus do? He served. Galatians 5, 13 through 14. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. Amen. Are we free? We're free Americans, yes. Are we more free than even that? And we have spiritual freedom. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Paul says, loving your neighbor as yourself is given feet when you serve one another. And then 1 Peter. So not only did Paul say it, not only did Jesus say it, now Peter says it. Not only. When Jesus said it, that was the one that mattered. Peter reiterates, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. I've said this over and over and over again. How many of you here sitting today have a gift given to you by God? Every single one of you. God has given each of you a gift. Why did he give you that gift? Use them to serve one another. New Testament is full of this whole idea. This is only a subset of the times that the New Testament tells us to serve one another. And they're not talking about coffee. They're not talking about children's ministry. They're not talking about helping greet. They're not talking about setting up and taking down chairs. 
what, 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 what Paul and Peter and more importantly what Jesus is talking about is loving people and sharing the love of Christ with people in a real and tangible way. Not because you're important, but because they're important. They matter to God. We got to rethink how we think about serving. Now, does that mean no one should do any coffee and that doing coffee is unimportant? Absolutely not. And sometimes when I talk about these areas of ministry, people go, well, then you're saying children's ministry is not important. No, I'm not. I'm saying we don't serve because it needs to be done. We serve to love Jesus and to show our love to Jesus to other people. Can you serve in children's ministry and coffee ministry and not be showing the love of Jesus Christ? Yes. Can you not serve in coffee ministry and be doing something completely different? Can you, here's, so Suzanne shared this story with me and, and, and it's important. It was a friend of yours, right? Friend of hers that was given a job. He'd been looking for a job, right? And he finally got a job. Clean, you're going to love this job. Some of you are going to run out right now and apply for this job. Cleaning porta potties. How long do you think it took for that job to get really old? Yeah, first one. <laughs> Cleaned your first one out and you're like, I'm over this. And, and he apparently, I don't know the guy, but you said he, he had an attitude about it. I mean, can you imagine getting up in the morning and being excited about going, oh, I can't wait to get started today. <laughs> I mean, there are poor, but God started to speak into his life and said to him, and this is the challenge I want to issue to us, said to him, why don't you start cleaning those porta potties for me? Now think about it this way. What if you knew Jesus was coming and he was going to use this porta potty? I know that sounds weird. But if you knew there was a porta potty in your control and Jesus was going to use that porta potty, what would you do to that porta potty? Man, you would make it spotless. Cleaning porta potties for Jesus. And he changed his mindset and it he changed what, how he thought about serving how he thought about doing the menial tasks that he was doing that day, and it changed everything. It changed his attitude, and he actually got complimented by one of the, the construction workers and said, you know what? Uh, usually the porta potties are absolutely disgusting on a construction site, but this is one of the cleanest porta potties I've ever been in, and we feel loved and cared for because of that. Because he changed his mindset about cleaning a porta potty. Anything you do in service to somebody else and you do it because you love Jesus and you want to share the love of Jesus with them, it changes everything. It changes the entire world. So in closing, let me ask you a couple of questions. And I wrote these down because I don't want to forget them. I want to go back to the Yelp thing. And I want you to ask yourself this question. What kind of Yelp review would God give you about your service? How many stars out of five do you think God would give your service to his kingdom? What kind of review might the people he's asking you to serve give you? You want me to keep going on with my questions? <laughs> now, I know the reason I say that is because I know I started asking myself the same question. I didn't like the answer I got, which begs a more important question. How do we improve our service rating? How do we improve? I mean, that's the point of Yelp. It's not only to help tell people which restaurants to steer clear of, but restaurants read that, and what do they know immediately? This is what I need to change. This is what needs to happen. If I'm getting poor service ratings, we need to improve our service. If we're getting poor food ratings, I need to improve our food in the restaurant so that we can do better. We all want to do better. We want to get a better rating from God, don't we? So how do we improve our service rating? The answer is you rethink your thinking about serving. What I mean by that is you got to understand that serving is a response to God's love for you and the fact that he loves other people. It's not a chore. It's not just a task. In fact, we can't think about it as a task. It's not a checkbox. You're not just saying God wants me to do this so that I can get a better uh, mansion in heaven. Now, I don't think any of us are doing that, at least not consciously. But we don't serve to earn something from God. What you're doing is worshiping God. 
And I'll be honest with you, until this past week, I don't know that I thought about serving as an act of worship, but it is. And I want to worship God every single day of my life. I want to worship him. You know, Jake said that sometimes he walks in this morning, and I think we all do, and we're not sure we're just, I don't know if I'm in the mood. I can tell you very seldom am I not, am I not in the mood to stand up and, and speak. But every once in a while, I'm not in the greatest mood, period. And you know when it's hardest for me to serve my kids? Yeah, when they're being a pain. But that's when I need to show them the love of Christ. And I'm sure I'm a, not sure, I know. I, I, can I just say very clearly that I am not the easiest person on the planet to live with? Just ask my wife, she'll tell you. She needs to love me when it's hard. And the way that we show that love, we rethink our service. Now, you've got a homework assignment. You can probably guess what it is. I want you to serve someone this week. I want you to, I want to say differently. I want you to worship God this week by serving someone. Do you see how that's different? I don't just want you to serve somebody. I want you to pick somebody. And, and what I would challenge you to do is pick the hardest person on your list. Now, why did I have to say that? Now, here's the really great news. I'm about to go on a, a mission trip to Germany for two weeks. You get people in a confined space, we're all going to have an opportunity to work on this. Because we're going to want to kill each other by the end of it. Why did you say amen so loud? <laughs> she was there a year ago, that's why. But you get in that confined space and that confined environment and, and you start to rub each other the wrong way. What needs to happen in that moment, our response needs to be not how can I get back at them? Why aren't they serving me? Our response needs to be how can I worship God by serving them? That's my challenge for you this week. Pick somebody out. Someone who isn't expecting it. At least get some joy out of it that way, right? Serve someone who isn't expecting it and just look at the look on their face. How could you possibly do that? Serve someone else. Here, if I'm gonna, you're gonna, this is the only thing you're going to remember this whole week. I'll tell you this. But if it cements it in your head, that's fine. Porta potties for Jesus. <laughs> Clean a porta potty for Jesus this week. Do the task you don't want to do to worship God and watch the difference it makes. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the journey you've been taking us on, for the fact that you love us, you care for us, you sent your son to die for us, for the other people in our lives, for the people closest to us and the people who, who just rub us the wrong way to the stranger that we might meet over the course of this next week. And Father, we want to change and rethink how we think about serving. That it's not just doing some menial task. It's not just checking off a, a checkbox we're doing something that the church needs, but that whatever we're doing, whatever we're doing, we're doing it as though we're doing it for you. We're serving you. We're worshiping you. We're cleaning porta potties for you. Father, I pray for every person here this morning that you'll bring someone, some circumstance to our mind and challenge us to worship you this week by serving somebody else in our lives and see the change that that brings about not only in the other person, but the change that that begins to bring about in us. Help us do that this week, Father, for your glory and all God's people said, amen. Before you leave, uh, I'm going to do one more prayer. And I don't think anyone who's going to Germany is in the room, are they? I'm looking. Raise your hand if you are. Would you be praying? I just want, as a quick reminder, would you be praying for our Germany team this, this next couple of weeks? We leave tonight, just to give you some details, we leave tonight at 740, and I will admit I am not packed, but I got plenty of time. We are all, there's seven of us going, and we're not sure still what we're going to be doing. There are details getting worked out. We're going to be doing some worship stuff. We're going to be, I can make a mean balloon animal now. We're going to be doing face painting and fixing bikes and all kinds of things to talk, to do exactly what we're talking about. We're going to be serving the people of Germany and sharing the love of Jesus Christ with them. So if you would just be praying over the course of this week, be praying for our travel over the course of the next day. We leave tonight and we get into Germany tomorrow night. 
uh, and the trip back is even a little bit longer. And just, just pray that we'll be a united, cohesive group uh, as, as, as over the course of the next couple of weeks. I'll be, I'll be gone next Sunday, but don't miss next Sunday. It's an important one. Chris will be here talking about a topic you do not want to miss. And again, changing our thinking about that. And then I'll be back the next Sunday. I think I get back on, we get back on the 28th, all right? Can I just say a quick prayer for that team and then, then you can be dismissed? Yeah. Oh, Father, I just pray that you'll be with us over the course of this trip that's coming up. I pray that your spirit will just go with this team, all seven that are going. Father, you know that um, six of us have been on a trip before and one has never been on a trip. So I pray for that one specifically, that, that uh, we don't overwhelm her. Uh, but that you will use us for your glory in Germany, uh, that you'll use us to do the work that you've prepared in advance for us to do, that you'll give us traveling mercies, that you'll go ahead of us uh, to prepare the hearts of the people that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Have a glorious afternoon and a great week.